Thank you very much, uh, Professor Meli, uh, Ambassador Ong, uh, and distinguished guests here. It's really wonderful to be back in Singapore. Um, I love that um, our borders are open to each other and we're able to travel freely. Uh, when we have a break, I will tell you my adventures yesterday uh, so that uh, you know that it's not all straightforward sometimes, uh, but it's wonderful to be back, uh, especially with my dear friends, of course, Ambassador Ong and, and Prof. Meli and Alistair and others. So thank you for choosing this topic. My goodness, um, I thought it would be a dream if we can actually start getting people excited about planetary health. Um, this is an area that I have been reflecting on for many years as a doctor and as well as someone who's been in the humanitarian development sector. And I'll tell you why personally it appealed to me and why it took me about two years and the pandemic to actually bring up, you know, actually realize, you know, the center. As someone who's been working in crisis all over the world, you know, and people are also involved in things like sustainability and SDGs, I realized that we're all putting band aid. Right? We're all responding, and the humanitarian appeals just grow bigger and bigger every year. And we're not addressing the underlying issues that are actually dri driving uh, us to so many of these crises. And I think uh, even in Malaysia, you know, it, it, uh, the, this great wake-up uh, on planetary health is really quite amazing. Just this uh, last week, I have been spending time uh, speaking at the Academy of Sciences in Malaysia, which actually dedicated um, the Science Week for Malaysia to planetary health. And lo and behold, tomorrow on World Health Day, uh, the theme of World Health Day uh, this year is actually planetary health. So we now live in the age of Anthropocene, where humanity, which is us, is the most powerful force shaping the future of the Earth, and in turn, dramatically impacting our individual and collective health. As the public health community started to wake up to this fact, so emerged the concept of planetary health. And in a landmark report published in The Lancet in 2015, planetary health was defined as the achievement of the highest attainable standard of health, well-being and equity worldwide through judicious attention to the human systems, political, economic and social that shape the future of humanity and the Earth's natural systems that define the safe environmental limits within which humanity can flourish. And this was an initiative by the Rockefeller Center and the Lancet. And in short, planetary health is the health of people and the planet on which we depend on. So one cannot thrive without the other. And I think that COVID-19 and the pandemic we've been living through now over the more than two years may well be that code red for humanity. To steal the words of Antonio Guterres, the United Nations Secretary General, and for a larger global crisis, one that will be induced by our neglect of planetary health. It's going to dwarf COVID-19 in terms of deaths and new illnesses, and there will be massive economic loss, damaged livelihoods, population displacement, biodiversity loss, food insecurity, antibiotic, antimicrobial resistance, more climate-induced humanitarian crisis, widening inequalities, and social and political unrest that will turn into violent conflicts. We are already beginning to see this now, as Prof. Meli has mentioned. And without a cost correction, we are headed into the realms where the human race doesn't have a compass for. So let me focus on a few of the factors we should be worrying about. First, and currently mo most prevalent in crisis management discourse, is health and pandemics. In my now rather many years as a doctor, I have seen a lot of pandemics and crises up close. COVID-19 is by far the nastiest I have lived through. It has shown us that there are serious shortcomings in the world's current ability to prepare timely and effective collective prevention of potential health emergencies. Ambassador Ong and I were reflecting that in 2009, we were all talking after H1N1 about pandemic preparedness. 
The tagline then, I still remember <laughs> working with the UN, it is a matter of when and not if that we have a pandemic. And yet we are unprepared. The failure for us and leadership to acknowledge and recognize and invest in preparedness is already apparent. And we've all had to suffer the last uh, two years plus. So equally worrying um, is that our collective capability is, even after this pandemic, woefully inadequate. For some of us, the pandemic was the first time that they've heard of a zoonotic disease, where the virus is transmitted from animals and people. But perhaps it's worth pointing out that 75% of pandemics are zoonotic. <laughs> and the origin in basically a disruption in the environment and human behavior. So our lack of care for the environment, how we manage our waste, and the fact that animals and humans are forced to live in ever, close, ever closer proximity as we encroach into the natural world. And in addition to the already frightening impacts that climate change is having on the animal world and on us, means that the crossover viruses between animals and us is on the up. And I don't want to be a doom and gloom princess here, but you know, you read too many of these reports where glacial melts are happening, and you know, as a result, um, there are many viruses unleashed. It sounds like this horrific US blockbuster movie where you know, some horrible disease is going to hit us, but in reality, it is help happening all over the world. While numbers vary, the estimates, and this is late 20, 2020, between 110 and 120 trillion of economic losses are cited by the IMF, the economists and others. Now that's 120% of global GDP. <laughs> Six million people have lost their lives. 487 million infections have been recorded and on the rise. At the same time, it has been estimated that an investment of approximately 20 to 50 billion dollars annually could substantially reduce the likelihood of future pandemics. That's just around 10%, 7 to 10% of the COVID-19 bill just in 2020. And I suspect the percentage is lower if we take the new data. So I will put it to you here, dear ladies and gentlemen, we are nowhere near prepared for the next global crisis. A group of us, uh, myself included, together with Dame Barbara Stocking, who used to be the head of the Ebola response, and uh, a few other scientists and former uh, health ministers are now you know, really pushing WHO and, and member states to look at a global pandemic convention. So I think that we need to bring in the whole issue around accountability and monitoring uh, for future pandemics. This year, 274 million people are expected to need humanitarian assistance around the world and protection with a price tag estimated by the UN at $41 billion. Now, when I started my humanitarian career, just mentioning one billion was already like a heart attack for all of us. It's now 41 billion, and it will never be met. The gaps will just widen and widen. And many of these people are caught up in situations where, which have roots in the climate crisis, which have roots in planetary health. In 2020, 33 out of 40 countries with the largest populations in need of humanitarian assistance were affected by disasters associated with natural hazards. Yes, conflicts make, make headlines, but we still have these disasters that are hitting us, especially in the Asia-Pacific region, really is a supermarket of disasters and disease. So climate and humanitarian hotspots overlap. To make matters worse, these are often countries that are already experiencing protracted, complex crises, thus exacerbating people's vulnerabilities. Also in 2020, climate disasters like intense storms and flooding caused by more population displacement than wars is happening. So we all need to recognize that this is not some distant future. Sea level is rising as we speak. 
Governments are moving artifacts and valuables away for safekeeping. I still remember a conversation I had with um, the Premier of uh, Kiribati and Tuvalu, who were buying land in Fiji and Australia so that they could start moving their historical artifacts because the island will be no more. Now imagine having to do that. Imagine thinking about all the things you love in your country, all the things that signify our history and our culture now being have, having been to be transported to other places. So, Indonesia is moving its capital away from sinking Jakarta. People flee not only from factors included in the now 70-year-old refugee convention, but equally legitimately from the climate itself. So by as soon as 2050, it is expected that there will be likely 200 million climate refugees. Are we ready for that? In our region, Asia and the Pacific, is that hotspot for unpredictable climate-related disasters. In 2021, more than 57 million people were affected. 18 million in India were severely impacted by floods and cyclones. Half a million in Bangladesh were swamped by floods with hundreds of villages affected. And you would have seen also affected some of the refugee camps uh, in Kutupalu and others in Cox's Bazaar. 13.9 million in China's Henan province were victims to severe flooding in July last year. In Southeast Asia, my own country, Malaysia and Indonesia, bore the burden of more than 1 million flood victims just in the month of November. Yet, if we look at another map, which details responsibility over production of carbon emissions versus the map of vulnerability to the effects of carbon pollution, they are almost directly inversed. To date, the world's top three biggest polluters contribute 16 times the greenhouse gas emissions of the bottom 10, while collectively, the top 10 emitters account for over two-thirds of global greenhouse gas emissions. Behind these numbers are obviously companies, and behind these companies are people. People who every day consciously make the decision to willfully damage the longer-term prospects of the planet over short-term profits. One-third of global carbon emissions are generated or created by only 20 fossil fuel companies. Fossil fuel companies that feed our addiction to oil, plastic, the latest phone, the newest Xbox, a car, flights, red meat, and so many other things besides. Take plastic as another linked example. After all, it's derived from fossil fuels. Plastic is a planetary health crisis with the latest and possibly scariest discovery being that microplastics are now being found in our blood. If that's not enough to grab your attention and national headlines, then maybe this will. Last year, about 200 tons of disposable, meaning takeaway containers, and I see a few on the table with plastic, <laughs> and plastic bags, were thrown away in Singapore. That's enough to fill 400 Olympic-sized swimming pools. So yes, the newly agreed process to negotiate the Global Convention on Plastic Pollution is a recognition of the urgency of our predicament. But if we all wait for treaties to be implemented and we remain utterly hooked on plastic and we manage its disposal so abominably, it will be too late. I'm very happy you have bottled water. So why aren't we beyond the point where there is a debate on the need to change? Why are we still debating? There is no doubt that we need a new system based on rethinking our values and developing a different way of prioritizing where and how we can manage the planet's bountiful resources to satisfy human development while remaining within the limits of what the planet can sustainably provide. When it comes to the environment, a good measure of the planet's health are the planetary boundaries identified by the Stockholm Resilience Centre, as shown in this slide. 
And I really urge you, if you're not familiar, to please look at the discussion on planetary boundaries that was led by Johan Rockström in the Stockholm Resilience Center, who's now in Potsdam. What we need is measurable uh, limits, right? We need to have metrics. I think if you don't measure it, you can't manage it, right? And, and I think that, you know, this planetary health boundaries are a good place to start. When these quantifiable biophysical limits are violated, the sustained existence of life on Earth becomes less certain. The most as recent assessment in January 22 uh, has shown that five out of nine identified boundaries, and most recently was the boundary for novel entities that include plastic, have already been breached. Urgent action to address these boundary transgressions is needed to reverse the deteriorating state of the planet and the catastrophic consequences for human health in the long run. Central to the planetary health concept, we talked about the planetary health boundaries, is donut economics, which is emerging now as perhaps the GDP model should be put into our history books. It hasn't helped us. It has come at the expense of the planet. And the new economic model that is proposed, you know, both by Kate Rayworth, who brought up this concept of donut economics, as well as Marina Mazzucato, who is talking about uh, value economics as well, mission economics, that you need to have an economic model that operates within a safe and just space for humanity. So there are two rings to this model. One is the outer ecological ceiling that I mentioned as the planetary health boundaries. But the inner circle is also the social foundation. Let's not be, let's not be idealists, foolish idealists. You can't have development without some degree of damage, right? Because you have to develop a nation. You have to drive your economy. But what you need to do is to be conscious that if you don't have that economy, is that you can't also develop your social floor. So the social boundaries, are, the social foundations are also important. How do you find that safe space within that apple green uh, area that just safe for humanity, just space for humanity, where you don't transgress too much your planetary boundaries, but you also make sure your social foundations are, are stable. And the more you can put people into that light green ring, the more you can achieve, you know, more sustainability, more well-being, more social harmony, and so on and so forth, and more health. If you have time, please look for a film called 2040 by um, Damon Gano, uh, who is an Australian filmmaker, and you will see Singapore featured in it as a best case example with the self-driving uh, electric cars. So it's a really proud uh, moment, I think, for Singapore. It's really well featured in the film. Um, it's a really, really good film. It's a film that gives you hope uh, and, and that you know, it is possible for us to have a better future. So it's called 2040. Yeah, I'm not going to say this, but you can actually torrent it, but uh, you can find it. So coming to that, let's see how we are behaving in terms of our economies, our planetary boundaries and so forth. If you go to the website of the Good Life Index on Leeds University, you will find every country has been mapped out in terms of its planetary boundaries and, its, uh, and its, who's closest to becoming a donut. And you will see, horrifically, our countries are not doing very well, Malaysia and Singapore. We have violated a lot of the planetary boundaries um, in terms of emissions, phosphorus, and so forth. But you will see, of course, with Singapore, you know, the social foundations are really strong, right? And, and some of, uh, you know, um, and, and Malaysia and the US are the same. We're all violating a lot of boundaries. But look at Vietnam. <coughs> Vietnam is the country in the world that has really violated very little of the planetary boundaries. It's, it's increasing its CO2 emissions with industrialization and so forth. It has to take care of this, right? But you will see also that it has some social foundations that are breached, but not so much. So that what is happening in Vietnam that is allowing it to be a little better than most of the ASEAN countries, we need to think and examine and interrogate this, but also use this opportunity to encourage Vietnam to do the right thing in terms of how it's going to you know, further its development, how as it be becomes a, an economic player uh, in the region that is important and globally as well, that it doesn't you know, damage its environment. So I think there's a strong case for us to look at that. Now, 
Oh, I'm not going to show that first. <laughs> I was going to ask you a question. The Asia-Pacific region is a microcosm of the global, global situation, comprising of high-income countries like Singapore and Australia that have met their citizens' essential needs as, uh, while violating the ecological ceiling. As well as middle-income countries, such as Philippines and Malaysia, they have preserved some of their ecosystems but face massive shortfalls in their social foundation, or those straddling both. Like uh, Malaysia, I think, is the one straddling both. Interestingly, the region is also the home, as I mentioned, to the country that is the closest to becoming a donut economy. So I think that is uh, important. So our region is really a microcosm, right? So I think this is just a, overview, a macro overview on my part to show you a little bit about you know, uh, the future risks, the current and future risks facing the region. But let's always remember behind all these numbers, scenarios, and I keep repeating this, especially in the pandemic, are people, right? And maybe it's an incurable optimist in me, but I believe that at least some of these people can produce, if, if adequately informed, and those of you in this, in this room especially, and motivated, and in some cases pressured, a different set of statistics and scenarios, more hopeful ones will emerge. Last night, I watched a fantastic video, and I'm going to share it with you, Prof. Melly, to share with the audience. And it's a really nice little, almost like a TED Talk, but animated. And it tells about the importance of hope and how it is sometimes the fossil fuel companies that want us to lose hope. Because when you lose hope, you kind of say, it's okay, lah, what to do? We can't change things, so let's carry on using plastics. But hope is very, very powerful. So I think that you know, I, I really have a lot of hope. So, how many of you in this room like burgers? All right, I will treat you to a vegetarian burger if anyone gets this answer right, and including those online, right? How many liters of water do you think it takes to produce a Big Mac? Just shout any number. How many liters of water? Don't Google, please. <laughs> Five. Five liters, okay. Prof. Meli. Twenty. Ten. Hundred. Anyone? You obviously do not know your burgers. <laughs> now, this is not a Big Mac. So a Big Mac, you double. It takes 5,000 liters to produce a Big Mac. And this is for this reason I've stopped taking red meat for the last three years. It will fill, just for a simple burger like this, um, 5,700 balloons filled with half a litre of water. So if you have a half litre bottle of water, it will be 5,744 bottles to produce one burger and double that, that for a Big Mac. So the vegetarian options are, are good, huh? And they're very good. <laughs> so I'm sorry, I'm not buying anyone a vegetarian burger because none of you got it right. But the advances that we have collectively made in agriculture, medicine, economic opportunity, and global trade have undoubtedly has significant impacts on human health and well-being. However, let me repeat that we are in deep into a dangerous feedback loop where unsustainable and negligible practices also contribute to the very issues they aim to address. The Asia-Pacific region is not only a hotspot for emerging infectious diseases like COVID-19, but also a hotspot for antimicrobial resistance, believed to be the looming next global threat. With resistance, while resistance to antimicrobials is a natural process, it is the overuse and misuse of antimicrobial drugs in our meat uh, producing animals, you know, particularly cattle uh, and, and sheep and chicken, uh, that has led to this. So, this improper use of antimicrobials, for example, at farms in Vietnam, to, has, it has been suspected to give rise to multi-drug resistance against foodborne pathogens such as salmonella. By 2050, 
It is estimated that antimicrobial resistance will result in 10 million deaths annually, almost half of that being concentrated in Asia. It's worse than COVID. And it's not just health. The impact will be felt in terms of the global GDP itself, measured as USD, 100.2 trillion expected total loss. And I'm really happy in this room, it's not just medical people or scientists, it's also economists and social, social you know, uh, people in the social um, sort of disciplines, policy makers. I earnestly hope that by being honest and upfront with you and painting this rather bleak, but on the state of the world now and in the next several decades, that I've grabbed your attention at least and prompted you to at least start thinking of what can I do? So please also believe me that when I tell you it's not all doom and gloom. Humanity is starting to see what's going on. The fact that we're having this discussion today because the initial effects of this global crisis are becoming more visible each year. One effect of these disasters is the fact that our leaders are being forced to take action against the drivers of climate-related disasters. Several countries have included internal displacement in their climate change policies and plans. Bangladesh developed a comprehensive policy framework on internal displacement associated with disasters and climate change in 2015. Malaysia dedicated its 12th Malaysia Plan 2021 to 2025 to be centred upon sustainability and a commitment to mainstream planetary health in policies and implementation plans, thus acknowledging the critical link between environment and health. Indonesia submitted an updated 2030 climate commitment last year with an unconditional and higher target to reduce carbon emissions to 29% by 2030, as well as new measures on adaptation and resilience. And while all this is going on, people are beginning to see and feel the direct impacts of environmental degradation. Speaking as a Malaysian, we were certainly shaken by the horrible floods last December that triggered so many more conversations on the climate crisis. I want to share with you a story, because this is why I do what I do. As a doctor, I, I'm, I'm always confronted with you know, patients' issues and, and people's issues. The little girl you see here is Ella Kissy Debra, and she died uh, because of a horrific respiratory um, illness. Uh, she, the mother always thought she had asthma growing up, she had childhood asthma. Uh, she lived in an area um, close to a roundabout, the school is close to a roundabout, quite a lot of traffic. And then she got really, really sick and she, she could not come out of her asthmatic attack and she was referred you know, to the Great Almond uh, Hospital in London. Eventually she died. Her mother fought for her death certificate to be changed, the cause of death from asthma to air pollution. And she fought really, really hard. My hair stands when I talk about Rosamond because I've been on a panel with her and she's so powerful. Now, every time she speaks, I'm reminded, could this be my grandchild in future? You know, could this be someone I really love? The reality is that we are being killed by the air around us. And we are still addicted to vehicles and transport. And Thank goodness Singapore has a fantastic public transport system, but not many countries do. And our, you know, our shift to electric cars and all that is very slow. But I remain the optimistic because look at what's happening in China. China's the fastest growing electric car market. There's a will to change from you know, fossil fuel dependent vehicles to, to, to electric vehicles. There's a will to change to renewable energy. So when there is leadership and there's will, things will happen and we can slowly reverse things. But we need everyone uh, to work collectively. And this is why I'll repeat that planetary health is a multidisciplinary approach that requires political, social, environmental health and economic collaboration and, you know, planning and so on and so forth. And, you know, that, and, and, you know, without concrete and rapid actions, things will only get worse. And do we really want to wait and see 
many more tragedies before we finally acknowledge that we are, in fact, late to act, that it must come together now to initiate change for the future of the planet and thus for the future of humanity. So when we set up the center last year, we're very new, but we're like a center on steroids right now. We decided to focus only on five themes, just to share with you. We're looking at preventing the next pandemic, tackling climate emergency, creating healthy cities, um, achieving food, uh, sustainable food systems, and promoting fair economies. I talked to you about the, the, hamburg uh, the hamburger and the meat and, and the methane that's produced by cows, but I also, need to remind us that 45% you know, of food in Malaysia goes to landfills. And out of this 45%, a lot of it is salvageable. I mean, it's still good food. The amount of food that goes to landfills, which are still good, can feed 3 million people per day. I'm talking about the Malaysian context. That's how much food we waste. And I think it's worse in other countries as well. So we're looking at all these areas, and we're looking at it from two lenses knowledge and research, and also engagement and influence. And our view is that there's no point for scientists to keep writing research that will only be read by scientists until and unless it's translated into policies. And there's no point communicating science unless you can communicate it in language that is so simple for even a child to understand. And one of the things we, we believe in very strongly is that education must change. So in the Sunway uh, University, which is a non-profit university, from 2024, so we're piloting the modules now, every student who enrolls into the university needs to pass a mandatory planetary health course called Community Service for Planetary Health before they graduate. Our hope is that when they do graduate and become some successful entrepreneur or policymaker, they keep that planetary health lens in front of them because they've gone through that module called Community Service for Planetary Health. I'm leading the center. My aim is to make the course material open source when it is finally ready in 2024 so that anyone can take it, adapt it, and use it in their universities. And we're now working with the Ministry of Education to see how we can actually bring in uh, knowledge on environment and climate change into primary schools. So I think you know education is still very important. So what I'm saying here is that you need to have long-term thinking uh, for, for this uh, situation. So let me end by saying, <clears throat> and, and thanks to Ambassador Ong for a really good conversation yesterday and today. We need, as a region, to focus on planetary health. It's not a matter of choice. We need to do this. We need to ramp up collaborative research, ramp up collaborative engagement and influence. We need to have a shift in policies. Ladies and gentlemen, in August, I set up the center. By November, planetary health was already in the 12th Malaysia plan. It took a lot of work, but building a network of champions who will speak on behalf of all of us who believe passionately in planetary health is really important. I sit on the Climate Action uh, Council, so now we're working on the climate policy and really foundation of which is planetary health. So as I was saying, the university itself that I work in, the whole raison d'etre of the university has changed now to that of planetary health. So whether you're doing engineering or linguistics or arts or culinary science or health, you have to have a planetary health approach to it. And we need an ASEAN approach uh, It's a good start, going beyond 2025. We need some kind of multi-stakeholder you know, uh, multi task force. Uh, we need cities to work collaborative together. And just to share with you that in a part of the donut economic model, if you read uh, Donut Economics by Kate Rayworth, or you go to something called Donut Economic Action Lab online, you will see a lot of great material and examples there. So Amsterdam, for example, has become a donut city. Um, so it's embracing donut economics. So I'm working very hard now to make Ipoh uh, the donut city for Malaysia as a model. And then, you know, let's try uh, different cities, bringing our own cultures, our own values, what is important and the, and the, you know, the natural sort of resources that are there. So I hope that I've shared, you know, useful prompts for your further discussion. But what I'm trying to say, it is possible, it is required, but it will require all of us to work collaboratively. And I really look forward to working with you, Meli, and others in this room so that we can actually drive this in, Asia, in ASEAN particularly, but also the Asia-Pacific region. Thank you very much.
thank you very much for that very inspiring talk, uh, Dr. Jamila. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to, just before we open it up to uh, questions and answers, we, are, we want to advise, advance the time because I know we are waiting for some of our uh, colleagues to be online. But, um, <clears throat> you know, in, in one of the uh, conferences held in Jakarta, talking about ASEAN, uh, there was a quote from a foreign minister who said, we cannot just keep on hoping. <laughs> Hope is not enough. And in RSIS at the Center for Non-Traditional Security Studies, um, the reason why we want to start this kind of conversation is because we're, you know, it's, it's not just hoping, it's really being able to think, bring on our thinking cap and see, okay, this is how far we have come in, in dealing with many of these issues. Uh, pandemic being one of them, and why are we involved in this conversation? Because, you know, as a think tank that looks at security in the wider perspective, beyond, of course, the traditional military issues, we need to be able to help continue with the conversation on what really matters. And when, when, when health, human health and planetary health are very much, uh, very important for our future, we really have to see how we can advance this in our research, right? and in our policy. So with that, um, I would like to open the floor now for questions uh, and comments, and let's keep it uh, short so that we will have some time. Uh, we can move on to the next panel. Yes, Margaret. Uh, yeah. uh, so thank you, Prof Nelly. So just a reminder to everyone, yeah. you all have microphones on your tables, uh, should you wish to ask, uh, Margaret. Uh, Dr. Jamila, thank you very much for your very rich and insightful presentation. Uh, so my, my question to you is that uh, in terms of approach, how is planetary health uh, concept different from low carbon development and initiatives that have been mainstreamed and worked upon by many countries uh, in, in the last decade or so? And why do you think that this uh, existing low carbon development initiatives are insufficient to attain the, the planetary health goals. Thank you. Yeah, let's take a few questions. Yes, at the back, yeah. Sorry. Thank you, Dr. Jamila. I'm Julius Trahano, also from RSIS. Uh, maybe it's, uh, my question is somewhat related to how Margaret constructed her question. And this is about the concept which has been promoted uh, in recent years before the planetary health. And this is the concept of the circular economy approach. So how can this approach be integrated with the, with the recent innovations and uh, promotion, promotive initiatives on, on the planetary health? Okay, um, any other question or comments? Yes, yeah, please. Oh, thank you, uh, doctor. I am a researcher on water waste energy interrelatedness. Uh, just wondering on the donut model, uh, can we sectorize? Because it's a bit unfair to compare Singapore's donut just because of its sheer size constraint. If you compare Singapore's donut with Russia's donut, it's really uh, cannot be compared. So rather than that, if we look at the donut for sectors, I'll give an example, uh, the defense sector and the food sector. The food sector, we are supposed to pay tax. The transport sector, we are supposed to pay tax. But the defense sector, in one millionth of a second, you are emitting million times more lethal global warming gases. So what's the donut looking like if you look at that? And isn't, aren't they responsible also to take care of planetary health? Okay, I think we have three questions. Over to you, Dr. Jamila. Yeah. Good. All very good questions. Okay, how is planetary health different from low carbon development initiatives? Low carbon development initiatives are a contribution to planetary health. Planetary health is the broader approach which is looking at you know, how environmental, social, political you know, uh, factors determine health, right? Okay, well, let me go back to one, one basic, I should have put a slide up. When I mentioned the word health, 
Just think of what you have a picture in your mind and say, okay, health. Most of the time we will think about health, especially now in the time of pandemic, is that making sure you have a good public health system, you have hospitals, you have clinics, you know that, right? Doctors, nurses and everything. But only 20% of the determinants of health are from the medical care complex. The determinants of health, 80% are environmental, behavioral and social. Out of which of the 80%, 5% is genetics. Which means that if you don't take care of the social, environmental, and behavioral, behavioral issues, you cannot attain health. Now, we saw this play out in the pandemic, right? Maybe not so much in Singapore, but in many countries of the world. You can have the best hospital systems and the labs. If people don't behave appropriately, the disease will spread. We were seeing this in Malaysia. We are getting to be the most obese country. You know, yes, people come to Malaysia to eat, but my God, we eat a lot. You know, and what happens now is we have high in NCDs, right? We have, we have one in two people walking around in Malaysia are diabetic or pre-diabetic and one in four are hypertensive. We are also aging. So we're getting older, but we're getting unhealthier. And all this is not just because, it is because of environmental, social, behavioral issues because we don't walk enough, we change our lifestyle, and so on and so forth. So health itself is a, is a very complex uh, system, not just depending on the health ministry. So for you to be healthy, the Ministry of Transport has to get their act together and provide good public transport, good walking areas, good cycling areas. For you to be healthy, you've got to eat well and stop feed, feeding yourself with you know, unhealthy food and, and so on and so forth. So similarly, when you think about uh, uh, low, carb low carbon uh, development initiatives, these are important to look at your emissions, but I've been trying to show you that it's not just CO2, not just GHG. You look at the planetary boundaries, also other things, also your, your, your water, your blue water, your you know, phosphorus in your uh, nitrogen levels and so on and so forth. So I think it's broader than that. And also the little issues around the, and the new, uh, new things that people are able to measure, including plastics, right? So it is part and parcel of planetary health, but planetary health is an overarching approach. Circular economy is, old, is, is, is very popular, but circular economy is a closed loop in the sense that, you know, it's about making sure that whatever is produced is recycled, it's not just about obfuscation and so forth, right? But donor economics is bigger. The donor economic model is the only one that takes into consideration the planetary boundaries. The circular economy doesn't. So that, that's the major difference. Now, I'm not an economist, but I will just tell you what I know. Uh, uh, but on your question, as related to your question, of course, what I'm trying to show you is the, the Good Life Index, which is worth looking at because there's a, there's a real scientific approach in how they come up with uh, these maps, uh, these, these circles. But you're right, you know, uh, uh, defense, <laughs> defense emissions are phenomenal. And I don't know if people actually measure defense emissions because, um, you know, uh, it, it's very political uh, at, uh, and geopolitically you know, very, very, very uh, sensitive to be to say to a country that you have produced X amount of emissions from defense. I could use the same argument to say, why on earth are we spending so much on defense when you're not even meeting the needs of people who are in crisis? So I think your point is really spot on. I speak a lot to Kate and I will ask her, uh, but I do encourage you to look at the Good Life Index and they're very responsive. The guy in there is called Andrew Fanning. Uh, he, you know, you, you, you you shoot an email to them, they always uh, shoot an email back uh, and, and they are developing. Now, just to share with you one last point, the donor economic model is still very much one that was designed when Johan Rockström came up with the planetary boundaries and Kate happened to be in the room and they said, so what is the economic model now that is going to accompany the planetary health boundaries? What we are doing, and I hope that there will be Singaporeans also interested, is to look at, is there a social and cultural determinant to the donor economy? Does it matter whether you're from the global north or the global south? So we are working with, with them now to, to look at this. Uh, and there are a few countries in the region that are starting to look at components of the donor economics. Now, in, in Singapore, I see you already having many good uh, features that could easily turn Singapore into a donor nation. 
you have you know, a, a very strong uh, public transport system, as I mentioned. I see everywhere people are growing food. There's more awareness. Singaporeans eat healthily. Uh, you know, so, so there are many, your, your social foundations are so powerful. The only thing you need to look at is you know, your, your planetary boundaries, right? It's particularly on GHG. And these are measured per capita. So, so, so this is why you know, a small country like Singapore will, see, will seem to be very large because it's by per capita. Okay, we'll just have a quick last round if there's anybody question, yeah. Um, we also would like to invite our uh, participants online if they have any questions, uh, we will just need to speed it up a bit because we, as I said, we want to move on to the next panel. Al, yeah. Thanks, Al Cook. Um, you mentioned earlier about community participation. So I'm wondering what, in terms of planetary health, what role is there for community leadership within it? And how does that play into uh, the decision-making and collaboration you spoke about? Thanks. Yeah. Now, that's a really important question and a very important point. So what we are trying to do, I'll give you the example of what we are doing, right? So um, we are we're working with Ipo, the, the city of Ipo. For those who know Ipo, they've got very good food as well. <laughs> Uh, to work with the local city council, the mayors, but also local groups to see, you know, what are the issues in Ipoh that can help drive a, a donor economic model. So we're looking at three issues, right? One is looking at uh, waste management, other is looking at uh, energy, and the third is a social issue. We're looking at whether it's education or, or, or financial literacy and things like that. So for that to happen, you need to have the community participate. So even in Amsterdam, when they started to do the donut city model, they actually have the, the whole process to building a donut city is very much about community participation. Because in Amsterdam, you have places where you have the cost of food, and they, and they will tell you that the cost of food added to the carbon, the carbon utilization, like the carbon footprint, it should be more. So encouraging to, to you to eat more local and so on and so forth. And that you can't do unless the community understands. So Amsterdam is actually doing very well on the Donut City model. Now on our part as well, uh, what we are doing is that you know, we have what we call a youth town hall. So we are engaging young people because I believe the future has to be with young people. So we have uh, boot camps. Uh, we have now, we're setting up a... a um, uh, 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 an award award for social innovation in planetary health. Uh, the Academy of Science Malaysia just approached me and we want to do an art for science uh, award uh, and this year on planetary health. So really getting people who are artists, who are young people to start thinking about what does that mean? So in, in, in our university, uh, we have the Jeff Sachs Center for Sustainable Development. So the students are exposed to SDGs from quite early. There's no plastic, nothing in the university is really quite green. So, but they, when they did our course, they said, oh, now I know what I have to do. So I, you know, in the, in the past, you do a course on SDGs, you understand, okay, here are the 17 goals, you know, da, da, da. But now when you run the, uh, the, the course on planetary health, it, it, they internalize it and they say, okay, this is what I need to do for the community. And this is what I need to do to influence the community. So, so community participation is, is extremely important. Uh, yes, Louis. Hi, thank you, Prof. Hi, thank you, Tan Sri, Dr. Jim, Jamila. Uh, my question is about uh, the distinction between low-income countries and high-income countries and when they should start adopting this approach. Uh, Hadrun Chang has uh, spoke about kicking away the ladder, wherein uh, higher-income countries have achieve where they are now because they have not pursued sustainability directly. Uh, thank you. Yeah, of course, this is always, this is what I'm saying that you can't talk about, you know, getting people out of a low income trap and all that without some kind of development that might pollute, right? Let, let's be, be honest about it. This is why I want you to watch the video that I'm going to send many. The thing is, the developed countries have already moved forward, right? Coal, coal utilization has dropped in, drastically in the developed world. Uh, the, the use of green energy is more advanced, you know, in, in the developing world, in developed world, which means that they're already doing a lot of the R&D for us so that the costs when it comes to the low income country will be much lower. I still remember I have a solar house, right? I mean, my house is very trying to be sustainable. But I remember when I first calculated how much it costs to put solar on my roof, 
I was like, you know, telling my husband, my God, you know, how are we going to pay this off, right? But now, three or four years later, it actually is much more affordable. Uh, and I actually am saving a, a lot on my electricity bills and all that because of, of solar. So even the solar panels have become cheaper and all that. And I, I always feel that China is the one that's going to really revolutionize all of us because they can produce uh, this stuff that we can use, right? So I think that low, low income countries have I, I actually, they're living quite sustainably, even as it is now. If you look at their, their index, they're very, very low. They are not the polluters in the world. But how do we make sure that as they develop, they develop in a way that has planetary health in mind? And we we're talking to Ambassador Ong yesterday. How do we influence Jakarta? When they move to Kalimantan, they don't destroy all the forests and then you know, rebuild another Jakarta. Uh, which is going to be overpopulated, which violates the planetary, uh, planetary boundaries and so on and so forth. So I think that kind of discussion has to be held now. Thank you. Um, I wish we could continue with this conversation. Yeah, but um, as I said, uh, we, uh, we would like to move on to the next uh, session now, but we, can, we have a networking session uh, during lunch. Uh, and Dr. Jamila has agreed to meet anyone who wants to know more about the concept. I just wanted to end, uh, 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 share a note before we end. You know, this conversation on planetary health doesn't just, you know, it's not just uh, confined to people who are interested about climate change, et cetera. Even in a, def uh, you talk about defense industry, even in the UN, the thinking in peacekeeping and humanitarian missions is that how do you bring this in? How do you integrate planetary health in many of the missions that you take. So, you know, we don't want to be behind the conversation as a university. I think we should be upfront there and doing our own research so that, you know, it's not just a conversation of the few and we cannot just be talking to, preaching to the choir, so to speak. There's a lot more conversation that really needs to take place. So thank you very much. Yeah, please. If I may, Melly, I forgot to say something. I mean, I was very much involved in the, the vaccination rollout for my country. And one of the things, you know, thank God I managed to convince our ministry was that we have a green vaccination program. So, so our vaccination program is consciously, you know, avoiding plastic uh, use bottles and water and stuff. We have calculated the carbon footprint of our vaccination program. We have calculated how much it will cost to offset. Now, offsetting for me is a cop-out. Huh? It's just not the way uh, to deal with the climate emergency. You know, the problem with offsetting is that all the rich countries will say, it's okay, now, you know, pay X million dollars, we'll plant trees somewhere in Indonesia or whatever. But that doesn't solve the problem. Right? What we need is that behavioral change to, de to use less of the you know, carbon, uh, carbon dependent uh, goods. But at least it's a start. Uh, and you know, I'm, I'm really proud of this because I think that you know, if we implement it, we have till 2023 to implement it. Then we, you know, we're already starting to plant you know, trees and whatever. But, but you know, these are the kind of things we need to think about, right? Uh, even even in, in small little things you do in your offices. For example, if you ban plastic bottles in your offices, the Minister of Health, who's my real ally, you know, he has banned any single-use plastic bottles in, in, uh, in, in the Ministry of Health. You know, really trying to change uh, the next transformation of health in our country will probably have a planetary health uh, angle. You know, I've written an op-ed with him for World Health Day tomorrow. So really getting those champions around you who understand that if you don't invest and put in place policies uh, for planetary health protection, you will actually pay a much bigger cost. And, and, and the fantastic thing is the data is clear. The more you invest in sustainable practices, your profit margin actually increases. And I think there's a demand now with ESG and others, right? A lot of the ratings of companies will be very much dependent upon your ESG rating as well. So I'll just put a little advertisement for everybody out there. Uh, we have put up a course, a, a PhD in business and planetary health at Sunway, which is free, tuition free, tuition fee is free, and you'll be given an allowance. You know, we would really like people from the region to come and look at business, you know, from a planetary health angle as well. Thank you very much. On that note, um, um, I just ask you to uh, join me in, in showing our appreciation to the speakers. Thank you.